they uh, they have to do a uh, planning so strict and not depend uh, on luck. I mean, the, uh, a brand, is there a possibility a brand to depend uh, on luck or luck plays no role in, in branding and in that sector? Well, when you call luck, it's called uncertainty. Uh, yes. There are, there are layers of uncertainty, there are layers of uh, types of risk, and, and then there's uncertainty. And there's uh, the types of uncertainty from uh, multiple to radical uncertainty. Um, certainly, there's no such thing as absolute certainty. The, the only absolute certainty ever since the advent of social media, authenticity is because the tone of voice uh, whereby uh, that's adopted by by, uh, by brands. And this is like transferring the attribute of authenticity for someone who's suffering from a major condition that cannot allow him to go any further, but it's authentic because it does you know, the, the, the most he can, uh, even if the from that condition, and this one speaks like that. So it's like the transferring uh, directly concerning the concept of motherhood as such, the second one, uh, the concept of uh, Paralympics, and the third one of authenticity in terms of the tone of voice and the mode of address of the theater. These details will, uh, we shall scrutinize them in, in detail during the uh, communication portion. And let's go swiftly into... Can I ask you something? Yeah. Is there any possibility, possibility to, for the, the brand, for PNG, let's say, uh, at their initial stages, the first stages, uh, to, uh, to base on luck about how it will go after 10 years? Or they, they have to do a planning so strict and not depend uh, on luck. I mean, the, uh, a brand, is there a possibility a brand to depend uh, on luck or luck plays no role in, in branding and in that sector? Well, when you call luck, it's called uncertainty. Uh, yes. there, are, there are layers of uncertainty, there are layers of uh, types of risk, and another is uncertainty. And there's uh, the types of uncertainty from uh, multiple to radical uncertainty. Um, certainly, there's no such thing as absolute certainty. The, the only absolutely certain thing uh, in this launch is that there's no absolute certainty about you will turn the market. Even if you have done absolutely everything that is known thus far. As regards to research, it's kind of consumer science. There's no guarantee. This is why in research agencies, when you sign contracts, normally you write in the terms that we cannot guarantee it's like bonds. Yeah, we cannot guarantee that what you receive as the research output will be applicable on the next day because of changing circumstances. Objectively, reality is changing second by second. It's only by create, freeze framing it and creating it love produced representations in a sense that we're trying to contain this change. Of course, the um, brand related attitudes and axiologies in general, that is human value systems, that do not change as easily and as quickly as more tactical aspects such as uh, the, the choice of a different brand that was a promotion, a battle brand was a promotion. They change at a slow pace, they tend to change gradually unless there is a radical change in the macrocultural environment. For example, a dictatorship that changes radically to the fundamental aspects of being, or the virus. The virus, well, in a sense, a change fundamentally uh, how we interact. Uh, you know, also it has affected all the entire spectrum of, of our lives. 
So in some cases, we are talking about a not well advertised brand or a false brand even. In, in the wrong way, I mean. Well, if you're looking at um, uh, creating a, an autopsy, post mortem, uh, then something that you have to identify on a case specific basis. You can, you know, say in advance that like, this will fail because of that, but if it will fail because of. No, no, eventually, eventually. Well, you, you cannot, you, you can't say that's why it's, it's called uncertainty. Yeah. The only thing you can do is uh, play around with the variables that are available in your, you know, in your hands. That is your four piece, your knowledge about consumers, the knowledge about the market, and the better this knowledge, the, the, le the less likely they will um, uh, fail. Now, um, for brand like this, I consider it very unlikely that will fail once uh, deciding to undergo to undertake such initiatives. First, because these initiatives concern the very foundations of the brand, that is a corporate brand name. Second, because the uh, impact on all product categories, so if something goes very, very badly uh, astray, it will impact the, the viability of the entire business. It's very unlikely that the uh, will be willing to uh, absorb or capable of absorbing. So, uh, prior to undertaking this, normally, again, benchmarking is very important. So, what you'll be looking at is corporate campaigns that were successful, that were stood the test of time, and then you start to construct them. What was the message strategy? Um, what kind of media way they applied over time? What was the competitive framework? The thing is that nowadays, most of the, especially the fast moving consumer goods categories, they're mature. And some of them have over 100 years, more than 100 years long histories. And during all of these histories, they have been repositioned various times. And have a uh, you know a, a life of their own. This why nowadays some uh, some these companies are hiring what's called brand genealogists. So it's people who dig through the archives and do exactly what you're saying. Yeah? They're, they're trying to understand what drove the brand to success over time. This is like preparing case that being paid to prepare case studies over and over. It's a very difficult, very demanding job, but strategically it's of paramount importance. This is why you understand why equity is so important. People are preparing historians, writing historians, which what it is really, to understand what you know what is that it did very, very uh, correctly, perhaps with this launch, whether this might be uh, repeated again, because they have a massive uh, archive of all uh, in which they can take for similar cases and cross fertilize them to other geographical territories, to other eras. Nothing or very little of what's been outlined nowadays is new. Um, I will be showing you an example from Coca Cola. Um, and it's a campaign, Things Go Better with Coke. But again, this, this was through the, this was around for 10 years in the 60s. From early 60s, late 60s. And it was a whole school of artists that participated in, in, in that campaign who created their own versions of the song Things Taste Better with Coke. From Tom Jones to Nancy Sinatra, any, you know, you name it. You know, no one in the very apex of the artistic um, edifice of that era who had not created a song through that campaign. To mother Savitz, it's not one of the best, if not the best uh, promotional, long-term promotional plan that could have been uh, going by company. So is there any wrong or right way to do branding? Or it's uh, all these are, all, um, are based on promotional activities and advertising? There's wrong, wrong or right? Or 
προμόσα αυτή τη σαν ορτάζει τις πάνω πλάνοι. Είσαι πάνω στο ράντεζι. Πράνιγκ, I mean, in the name of the logo. Πράνιγκ, I mean, in the name of the logo. And usually it's a mixture of local properties. You can have one and forget all the other. So it is never promotion. For example, when you're looking just promotion or advertising, or when it is, you need proof. Normally, in awards such as the International Institute of Partitions and Advertising, IPA, they're one of the most, most demanding uh, committees and criteria for uh, go to the effectiveness campaigns, of less effectiveness. And in this context, they tell you use econometrics. Uh, it's only by using econometrics that you can uh, identify the relative contribution of advertising to the successful brand loans, sectors uh, by having held equal. Uh, you know, without without any further changes across the whole piece. Because, for example, you might you may run, you may have expanded your distribution, may have doubled your distribution during the brand launch. So you have to clear the effect of the additional distribution from your uh, incremental sales in order to identify what is the real contribution of the price. Or you might have run more. Price-based promotions than usual during the uh, launch, because perhaps we might have thought that price, uh, this launch might be very relevant to price conscious consumers, because you have kind of much what Daniel suggested. There's no right and wrong, there's absolutely no rule that is cut in stone when it comes to marketing. No, I, I meant about the, the logo and the name. It's just a variables and KPIs and criteria. In order to mix and match them, uh, and do correct planning uh, prior to launching a product. But if there's no way of saying that um, uh, because that brand did it by benchmarking the type X, uh, it's very likely that we're going to succeed as well. There's no way of producing a 100% representative picture of the health at the point of, of launch. Mm -hmm. so, and, and of course, uh, the, the, the marketing complex is not the same. Something that worked a year ago may not work you know, the, the, the next year. Okay. All right. Um, there are two main uh, continuous drive architecture. There are two main avenues for extending. Uh, the first one is by uh, producing line extensions. This is the easier part, um, where the product, uh, the product brand covers a new product within a product category that the category serves. For example, new flavors, new forms, colors, ingredients, package sizes. And the most, this, the most difficult route is the category extension, one of the most more difficult than the line extension. It's a category extension where the product brand uh, is used for entering new categories, for example, the non extended from real yogurt, and the uh, most difficult scenario, as we said earlier, where this diversification strategy, not as difficult for veggie, but definitely for other product categories that do not have that, let's say, very uh, uniquely qualifying link between these different uh, 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 ventures. Now, um, we only have six minutes to go before we conclude today's se section. And, uh, but I would like to introduce you to driving models, at least one, because this will be a very nice bridge with the model, not every models that we'll be looking at uh, next Monday. Nevertheless, as you can tell, we managed to cover up to slide 40 out of the 109. It's not your fault, definitely. I would like to participate on the other on the very contrary. I very much enjoy your session and your uh, comments, contributions, which are very edifying and very to the point. But the last part is, as you can see, of uh, uh, techniques, research techniques. Again, uh, the same scenario will be repeated 
but we have more equity, so we just incorporate this within a larger equity-based uh, session or two, or perhaps an extra session for Friday. <laughs> I can see you know, what we do for this one. Okay, just say right. So let's conclude this uh, session with a, a, a brand new model um, by uh, Jean Marie a French uh, marketing scholar, and uh, quite famous for his uh, uh, branding uh, of luxury products. Uh, the model is called the brand identity priest. And as I said, it's uh, a very, uh, there's a brand way whereby Jack Fetter employed that uh, brand identity. How do we employ brand identity for this course? Uh, what? How do we employ brand identity for this course? Where does it start from brand identity? Anyone can remember? What was the match of October 1 for you? Has it been covered by the piece of information? What does it mean? Yes. Um. Uh, it's the combination of uh, those elements that you said before, name, logo, the values, the um, culture, and... To identify and differentiate from other brands. It's a, it's a projective part versus image, which is how these are reflected in consumers' minds. Mm -hmm. So a brand identity is all the objective elements that you use for projecting your brand image, but it doesn't include brand image. Cafeter mm -hmm. is included brand image in his brand identity prism. Okay, let's forgive Cafeter. <laughs> it's just Cafeter. Yeah. I don't agree with that because uh, the concept of identity has been multifariously uh, defined, operationalized, and speculated across disciplines across millennia. It's exactly the same as subject, individual, the monad, or whatever. So it's like, you know. Uh, taking a, a, an empirical realistic perspective and then it, it, giving it a dialectical twist. So it's just like uh, making identity more dynamic. This is why Kaffer says that identity is about the the dynamic concept rather than just the sum of design elements, which is how we will be using it. And we're doing this for the sake of both clarity Parsimony, and in terms of clearly identifying what we're talking about when you use the stems. Otherwise, if you dialecticize the stem, you end up with a very muddled, very confused representation. If this is identity, then what is brand image? If it was brand image as well, why do you need brand image? It becomes absolutely redundant. Unfortunately, more people terms tend to be operationalized occasionally whimsically, and they're not very um, well-informed way by other disciplines or by seeking to make your own contribution literature without having check first whether an equivalent or a substitute term might be used as well. For example, there are other terms that I find personally uh, not at all useful, such as brand law. What brand law is? Yeah, brand law is when brand attachment, all sorts of terms. Why do you need brand law? I find it so utterly useless, and yet there are you know, quite a lot of articles that try to jump, uh, jump the bar and uh, you know, uh, regurgitate it as a valid term, the merits of its own followers, you know, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, this academic research in general, so I'm not going to take any sides, just saying this for the sake of our blogs, but brand identity is brand praise. All those part of um, your um, suggested readings. And I still think it's a, it's a very nice model. However, we must make this very succinct point in order to avoid any confusions because it's only confirmed that music is in, in this way. Now, this is why brand this is uh, use the praise metaphor 
because the previous time they are turned around, and as you tell me, you obtain different refractions in the same reality. So, reality is perspectively reflected into the same Nietzsche. Of course, other it's just anyway, so for those who don't start lost me, they don't care. Uh, you think it's not a first to say that, that truth is for the society more anxious of phenomenon. That's very precisely, but this is very talk is model. So, Brunkers takes an account both sides and receivers' perspectives, whereas, from one point of view, it's only the protective part of an identity. And this, of course, will embed the branding process in communicative trajectory. Everything with everything else. Well, having the two inter interdependent and mutually reflecting facets of intending and receive positioning. So, whereas for us, it's all the intended part, for him, this two are uh, interlaced both intended and received. And so, what it looks like, like a prism, quite expectantly, where we have the two sides, externalization and internalization, or the projective and the, the received side. At the apex, uh, we have the center and the bottom with the receiver. <coughs> and as regards specific parts of the prism, the physique refers to the tangible elements, or colors, shapes, design elements, or what we call identity. For example, the, the entire identity for us is obscure. For example, Lacoste, uh, physique includes the logo, the shoes, and the main logo just do it. His personality includes uh, the brand's character, uh, what we were talking about earlier about brand personification, uh, what kind of uh, human traits you would use for addressing this brand as a human. For example, for Nike, these terms are sporty, athletic, and very lifestyleish. Uh, culture refers to the right hand side, the, brand, the brand's values within the cultural context of its consumers. This way, on the other side of the prism, we have relationship that is that must be bound by a common cultural predicament. This is why, for Nike, for example. It's a, it's a brand that almost pushes you to exceed your capabilities. Uh, this is the kind of relationship that wants to establish with its consumers. In terms of culture, uh, this is a very competitive culture. Uh, it's uh, American culture, which is quite competitive. Uh, and these two are interlaced. So you want to capitalize on the cultural traits uh, for example, uh, uh, a dominant American culture of the sports, and transfer it to the relations between yourself and the brand by saying that Nike is a brand that always pushes the bar, tries for uh, more, and never rests on its laurels. Reflection is the first the user personality is projected by brand as perceived by distinctive consumer segments. Again, the dual part, uh, both projective and received. So Nike also reflect as a brand, it's always a brand full of energy, aggressive, youthful, and competitive. For an ideal user image of someone who's athletic and very brand conscious. Uh, again, the term athletic means different things in different contexts. For example, for the Olympic Games, being athletic means engaging in uh, uh, competition, uh, cross cultures in a civilized manner, and so on and so forth. Athletic for Nike is pushing the barrier, is always trying for more. Uh, it's quite confrontational as well, it's very confrontational culture. We'll be watching a, a very important commercial by Nike the fight between good and evil that was launched in the 90s, and it was largely responsible 
for the increase in popularity of Nike in the European market was a massive hit. And we've been looking at this commercial uh, quite in depth uh, in uh, week six when we're talking about mythological branding. Uh, the impact of mythology or uh, deep, deep brand storytelling on the way brand messages are carved. And without further ado, let's call it, uh, let's call the shots for today. Uh, thank you very much um, for participating. I don't know if our colleagues who are now uh, online have any questions. Or oh, if you have any questions, we could have prepared the session. Okay, okay join Thank us you. on your evening. I hope to see you, Thank you so much. Uh, next Monday. Bye.